Hello and welcome. And welcome to our session at the Real Oxford Farming Conference. We did expect to do this in person, so back online is um, rather strange again, but we're happy to be together. Um, I want to say a huge welcome and thanks to our speakers today. Helen Browning, many of you will know, um, a farmer and chief executive of the Soil Association. Stephanie Slater, who leads School Food Matters, working across government and the public sector on driving better food across the school food sector. And Nicole Pisani, who is executive chef at Chefs in School, who are working and inspiring local communities to get back and produce and cook uh, better food. So we've got our sort of better panel, as it were. Um, eating better, many of you will know, but we're uh, an NGO alliance of over 60 organizations now working to drive change across the food system. We're working with the public sector, uh, with private business and promoting less and better meat and dairy um, and we want to create a food environment which is affordable, healthy and sustainable. So you'll recognize many of the organizations that we work with and um, many of you will also probably be on the call. The aim of today really is to take stock of what we've done last year in a sense that we've for the first time created a series of films um, from across from the farm through to uh, the citizen buying the product and we want to take the opportunity to sort of reflect on that reflect on what's happened across the pandemic and the environment we're currently in um, all eyes are on the public sector what are the opportunities around the public sector um, all eyes around the future of the farm subsidy regime what does that what does that allow us to do in terms of building back better building a stronger food culture um, and we have three excellent panelists to help us today. We've created a roadmap, a sort of you know, blueprint on areas that we need to work on. There's no silver bullet around this solution. And we've developed these films um, to try and bring this to life. So I wanna show you our first film, which we're doing over Zoom. Um, so I hope it works technically for us all. Um, these films are short, they're five minutes. Um, and then we'll get into the discussion that follows. I'm very, very privileged to be here. Obviously having little Ewan um, and bringing him up here is absolutely amazing. Um, and it's just really fresh, lovely fresh air and you can see the butterflies and dragonflies and bees, they've all come back here, you know, with everything that we've done um, to put the farm back to how it should have always been. Nestled deep in the Devonshire countryside on the edge of Dartmoor is Eversfield, an award-winning organic family-run farm certified by Eating Better members, the Soil Association and Pasture for Life. Here, a 200-strong herd of Aberdeen Angus is given space to graze the lush grasslands while delivering benefits for soil health and wildlife. Farming in tandem with nature, with fewer animals fed only on grass. It's a movement for change, putting the focus on less and better meat. It was one 90-acre field um, when we first bought the farm and that's not a traditional Devon field. So we decided to put in uh, hedgerows to break the fields up. This is amazing and the hedgerows look really well established now. We're farming in a very, very natural way. We're not giving the animals antibiotics unnecessarily. We're giving them, you know, the best life possible. They've been fed on grass, which is what they're, you know, ultimately designed to eat. They're, they're not designed to digest grains and cereals. Um, so they've been reared a lot slower than the conventional cattle. Producing better is on this field really, in this landscape. It's about looking after animals, caring for nature, caring for our own health and caring for the health of the planet. Oh, 
dogs are doing well, they're getting a good bit of shade, they're getting protection, and they're also getting some decent grass. The grass is bit... really good this year. Yeah. You've got to look after your farm in a way that nurtures the soil and therefore delivers the, the grass to eat. You also have to revert back to the more old-fashioned animal, animal types, the traditional cattle. In our case, we farm Aberdeen Angus, as you've seen, but the great thing about an Aberdeen Angus is it can survive on the highlands of Scotland. It won't grow fat, but it will survive fine. You bring it down onto, our, onto lovely lush grass pastures and hay meadows, then they do really, really well. If you do it properly, all the good things you're doing to get a traditional animal to deliver you a, a great meal on your plate has done a huge amount of good for the planet. With the grass, we never allow the cattle to eat uh, the grass right down to the bottom of the roots. Um, we always uh, rotate them um, and this allows that uh, the grass root to be a lot stronger, which allows it to um, form a better root below the ground. Nothing goes to waste on the farm and in a closed loop regenerative model, organic compost from the herd is used to grow vegetables and fruits in the market garden, many of which have been specially selected to support sustainable horticulture and to encourage bees and other pollinators. Since the pandemic, where our food comes from has become more important and traceability connects the citizen to the land on which the animal was reared and valued. At Eversfield, all the meat is hung, butchered and packaged on the farm and every cut can be traced back to the animal it came from. Our model is working. We've been doing this now since 2004. So the you know, proofs in the pudding, we've, we've got it here. It really does work. We're talking about encouraging people to eat less meat, but meat that is in touch with the land. With the right support from government, from the right support from retailers, this can be rolled out. It can help us all to eat much better. Beautiful Devon. We were lucky to get the opportunity to visit Everfield far Farm earlier in the year um, and a fantastic film we put together. Helen, one of your leading organic farmers, um, we're here talking about the sort of commercial benefits and how to build demand for the better. What do you take away from the film? What's your, what's your, what's your take on the sort of broader benefits and commercial benefits of farming in this way? I think it's always hard to um, uh, answer the question, uh, what are the commercial benefits? Because I think that an organic farming system is so fundamentally different. Uh, when people ask me here, what would your profitability have been like if you were farming conventionally? Um, you know, it would have been a very different farm. It might have been all arable um, rather than actually the mixed range of things that we do on the farm here today. So. Uh, the stats over time show that organic farming, you know, probably is about as profitable, sometimes better, sometimes a little bit less good than conventional farming. Um, but what we tend to see is that the income is a little bit more stable because you're not, you haven't got all your eggs in one basket. We're more diverse farming enterprises. And I always say to people, actually, don't go organic um, on the basis that you're going to uh, make lots more money. Um, it's got to be something that you feel your heart is really in. Um, but the co-benefits, the other benefits of farming in this way are just huge. Uh, you know, the benefits to biodiversity, to wildlife, the benefits to soil health and carbon sequestration, the benefits for animal welfare, you know, giving animals a, the opportunity to have a, a really good life. Um, the differences in nutritional quality. 
uh, and the kind of the opportunity we have to create more diverse, meaningful employment on farms. You know, there's good evidence for all of those benefits. And I think, you know, when we look to the future, these are the kind of farming systems we need to see. We need that shift to agroecology. Um, we have to get the numbers to stack up. I, I must say, I don't think any farming system is uh, without its challenges commercially. It's not an easy way of life uh, to make money in, um, but doing it right is what drives all the organic community that we work with and many other farmers too. I think there's a real desire to play the best role we can in tackling the challenges that the world is facing now through better farming. So the co-benefits are there and, and commercially, if we survive, we can make it work. If we can uh, provide meaningful employment for lots of people, we can give our animals a good life, then that is an amazing way to live a life. An am absolutely amazing way to live a life. Stephanie, how, how do you think the public sector can really support this? You know, is there, we talked about all eyes on the public sector. Uh, Helen's given us a, a passionate account of something I want to support through my, through my purse. How do we do it? So look at the market we've got there, two billion quid spent on public sector food. So we could spend that more wisely. I'm sure many a taxpayer would get behind this, know that their money is being invested in good farming, better meat and dairy, um, better for health, better for the planet. And I think there's a moment, I, I guess I'm sort of coming from the school perspective. There's a moment now, which I think we all agree, where young people are very interested and passionate about climate. So if we can introduce the conversations about different farming methods while they're in a school environment and they've got the space and time to really explore the issues around that um, with this context of um, the climate emergency, I think it's an opportunity not to be missed. Um, we also know that we are a lot of caterers, perhaps we have caterers um, in this meeting today, Nicole will be able to comment on this, but we're hearing lots about increases in food prices, 10%, somebody, a journalist phoned me yesterday talking about a 10% rise in food costs. Um, and we just got to get canny with the way we access um, higher welfare, high quality food, and we do that by eating less meat. Um, there are clever ways of doing that within the school food um, menu and school food standards. And I think this is probably a really great segue through to Nicole, who's been doing some really fantastic work in this regard. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I wanted, while well, preparing uh, for this talk, I actually tried to get um, a few statistics with regards to volume of meat and fish that we are currently serving. Um, chefs and schools work with 60 schools across the UK currently. And our fish supplier this morning delivered 600 kilos of haddock. So the volume at which, you know, if you did really have to look at purchasing better quality, but actually purchasing less of it on, on writing a weekly menu, uh, the volume is really high. So it does lead to a good angle on the purchasing power. If you are buying this amount of fish and meat, another example is one of our schools uh, this morning, it's a secondary school, it has 700 pupils and it uh, served 1,600 chicken drumsticks. And that's one school in one day. So it is a it, we just, I think we have to stop looking at the re reduction of cost and actually being, like Stephanie just said, being cleverer with a huge amount of money that the government actually spends per year in schools with buying food. Um, so yes, even I, I was a bit shocked with the statistics actually. Um, I thought, my God, we are actually buying quite a lot of meat and fish. In and saying that, uh, we do serve meat and fish three times a week. So, in just, most of our schools. Sorry, just, Steph. Yeah, I'm just just going back to how School Food Matters started um, back in 2007. That was purely because I was one parent looking at the quality of the food being served to my children and just being absolutely appalled coming 
from it a background of cooking and growing food and you know interest in environmental issues um I never meant it to be a charity or a campaign. I just thought we could do better. And I think it's always about being a bit ambitious for our young people. And I think the, the, the one thing I had on my side was absolutely no knowledge of public sector procurement. I knew nothing. Um, I think had I known how complex it was, I probably wouldn't have got stuck in, but I just went in with an ambition thinking, come on, we can do better than this. We were, the children across um, the 38 primary schools in the London borough where my kids went to school um, were being served a frozen meal made in a factory in Wales. It just did not make sense to me at all. And that's not, I mean, that was me being a pushy parent, but it was also the children were voting with their feet. Only 26% of children were taking a free uh, uh, school meal. And that included a very low uptake for children who got a free school meal which you know, to me is completely woeful. We were doing a really poor job. So I think just going in there and, and being ambitious and saying, well, what do you want school meals to look like? And then the market responds. If you are ambitious in your food specification, we went in with, um, Helen will know it was a food for life menu. We went in at silver and we achieved gold and the meal price actually came down. And that is because of bums on seats. We, we, if you sell poor food, few children will eat it. If you sell excellent food and tell the story behind the food, more children will eat it and you'll get the economies of scale that make it financially viable. And now since then, of course, we have universal infant free school meals. So we do have considerable investment going into schools and we do have the buying power, we have the numbers. So I think it's all about being ambitious and deciding what you want for your children in your school. Helen, does that chime with you in terms of the Food for Life programme and, and your experience over the last sort of 10, 15 years? What yes, just worry does. so much about cost. Well, I, th I think uh, Stephanie's absolutely right. I mean, the way we've managed to bring costs down and to make it bearable for the caterers to upgrade uh, the quality of their food is by reducing uh, the meat on the menu, um, largely reformulating the menu, um, because that's usually the most expensive part of the uh, of the meal provision. Um, and absolutely right. And um, as this, as the school food plan said, you know, uh, if we actually can get uh, the the volumes through, you can start to get those efficiencies of scale. So all those things are possible. And food for life over the last. You know, 12 years, you know, we're now feeding 2 million meals uh, a day. Um, half of England's primary schools are now getting a Food for Life menu, but it should be all schools and it should be all secondary schools too. And I'm still uh, appalled really that, uh, you know, nearly 20 years on from the Curry Commission, when we said, you know, public procurement is a huge priority for government, we have to invest in children's long-term health through feeding them in the right way. Uh, that we're still uh, not getting the emphasis on public procurement that we need to see. And it is us in our charities who are making this happen. Uh, it's parents making it happen. Um, and uh, whilst there's been lots of improvements, lots of caterers getting really involved and helping drive change, this should be now the norm. There is absolutely no reason why this should, this, this, this should be, there should be any exceptions to our ability to feed children really well with healthy, fresh ingredients. Thanks, Helen. So that's a really good segue into our next film, which is uh, filmed in Mandeville, one of, the, one of the schools that Nicole and her team have been working really closely with, um, described by some of probably as rather niche, but essentially what we want to see across the broader uh, school sector. So um, if we can segue into that film and then come back to this discussion further. I think it's really important to win over hearts and minds of your whole community and, and beyond. So that means all the stakeholders, the parents, the children, the staff, and the local authority and everyone you'll be working with, particularly your kitchen staff, obviously. Once you've done that, you can then start to move forward. You can design things together. If we are committed to taking steps 
on climate, food, buying power, it's, it's, it's the way to go. It's obviously a way to go. And we're seeing that reflected in schools, particularly the young people we talk to. So when we want to have a conversation with young people about food, it's quite interesting that climate is something they really engage with. We cannot tackle the climate and nature emergencies if we don't tackle food. So we would like local authorities to put food at the centre of their strategies to meet these climate and nature emergencies. Our Serving Better Guides shows that this doesn't need to be complicated. It's all about putting strategies in place to serve more vegetables, more pulses and less and better meat. There's a lot of good talk about supporting agroecology and how we want more sustainable farming systems and you know better land use. But on the other hand, you know, we are absolutely complicit in deforestation in our supply chains. There's this race to the bottom in terms of ever cheaper food. When we're importing cheap food from abroad, it's at the cost of environmental animal welfare standards as well. I shudder to think of some of the meat that we were serving in schools by really selling the vegetarian meals and then balancing those with really good quality meat on the two days that we do meet. And this is, this is the corn, which is a good alternative to meat. Once it's spiced up and everything, you don't really notice the difference. We've made the changes gradually by introducing different ways of cooking vegetables. I've been here in school meals about 40 years, and when we started, it was just steaming and boiling. Let that um, soften a bit before I add the garlic. The positives are we've learned different cooking skills, different ways of cooking with herbs and spices that make it more interesting and with the technical side it's opened our knowledge of food. Samia's vegetable samosas. So the whole food model across the school and we looked at the menus and we were able to balance by having two vegetarian days, two meat days and a fish day, we were able to create an affordable menu that was sourced from very high quality producers without increasing the overall cost of a school meal. To be able to have a school meal that's cooked fresh on site every day is really important for our children's education. You can eat um and nice food. The fish is good and it's healthy and the chips are homemade. It's good and healthy for you and it keeps you nice and it keeps you strong. Where we learn as adults we can pass it on to the children as well which is better for everybody in the long term and this is the aim of um, sustainable food and eating healthily. It is possible to change your food for the better and to do it for no extra cost. And I think if the drive is there among school governors, school leaders, local authorities to make that happen, then our children will get better food and in the future will be healthier and in the end will be a less of a cost on our health service. If you set up an ambition for contract caterers or whoever's bidding to compete, to do the best for children rather than the cheapest, great things happen. And with that, of course, meal numbers go up, more children are eating great food, and the economies of scale mean that it's financially viable as well. We need to grow more locally and have those local supply chains. And I think what's been happening lately in terms of the, the crisis in our food supply chains demonstrates that even more than um, in the past. But, so we need, but we need local authority caterers to be, to be properly resourced. We then need those networks where they can access the, the fresh fruit and veg within a reasonable travelling distance. Simple swaps to recipes to put more vegetables on the menu 
can have a huge impact in reducing carbon emissions. Local authorities and other public institutions serve hundreds of thousands of meals every month, so the impact of rolling this out across the country could be massive. It's a great film full of lots of passion. Stephanie, um, we'll come over to Nicole who can tell us a bit more about the story behind Mandeville. Stephanie, why, why is, you know, the bubbling with passion around school food, why is this agenda, the sustainable food agenda and the lesson better me, why, why is it so important at, at the level of schools? You know, what, what really struck, this is, I'm speaking to somebody that set up a charity with the strap line farm gate to school plate. I thought it was going to be really easy. <laughs> and what I found along the way is there is a lack of skill and knowledge within schools and the people that are procuring school food. Now, I know this because, as I said, I had no background in this world at all, and I went into a local authority where people were sitting around the table saying, well, we can't do this. We don't have the equipment. It's too hard. We don't know. Uh, and, and they were people who wanted the best for the young people in the schools, but they couldn't navigate their way through the complexity. Um, so I was really pleased when I saw the National Food Strategy with, a, with an emphasis on procurement, talking about mandating standards so that we start having a level playing field. And the other part of it that it might be missing and needs a bit more development is training for school business managers, because they're often the people that are tasked with putting the food specification out and, and they are tasked with getting what they want. And often they don't know what they want because they don't understand the, the landscape. So I think it would be incredibly valuable to create some sort of training for the people that do procure stuff in schools because it's often the same people doing food as doing stationery, doing transport, doing any number of things in a school. And there needs to be a level of expertise. And Helen and I have been around long enough to know that there was a um, public sector procurement moment a couple of years ago with a balanced scorecard and lots and lots of information out there. But for some reason, it is not getting into schools. It's the, the message isn't getting out and probably because it's not terribly sexy. I go to parties and they ask me what I do and I say I campaign on public sector procurement. You can see them head for the door. You know, it's we need to make it accessible to anybody who is tasked with getting school food right. And I think we can NGOs have been playing a part in this for donkey's years. But I think it's time for DFE and DEFRA to work together on this and get some really good guidance and training. And I think somebody mentioned, maybe it was Nicole, about the role of governors. Um, the NGA, we're having interesting conversations with them at the moment, that's the National Governance Association, about this very thing. And with the School Business Managers Association to say, what can we do to play our part, to get the guidance out there, to help schools write a good specification that's going to attract quality. Um, and, but I, I really believe that some of this needs to come from government and maybe the national food strategy will give it the um you know adrenaline it needs to get it right thanks stephanie nicole how, how do you think we we build this passion in the schools around sort of sourcing local high standards of produce how do we you know and what role can farmers and local suppliers play in that really i think stephanie's hitting at some of the big structural things around the government um, but clearly, you know, what can we do bottom up to create that excitement and passion that we saw in that film? Um, I think I think Stephanie's right, because um, one major challenge with schools is that a bit like me and Stephanie, really, we went into the job without the tools or the knowledge and kind of found our way whilst doing it. But for business managers, it is really hard for them to understand procurement. And apart from it being really hard, they actually don't have the time to do price comparison to make sure they're getting, and the chef also, the school team don't have, the school kitchen team don't have the time to be looking at prices and to be looking at sourcing. But one of the best compliments I think that 
we got at Shefton Schools was that a business manager called me and she said, oh my God, I'm so happy that I'm signing invoices from the local butcher on the street because she lived just around the corner. And I thought, why aren't all schools doing this? Why aren't they going on the high street and asking the butchers, asking the fishmongers, where can we, can we source our supply from you and where, where do you source your supply? So it's actually looking at how, you know, it's bringing it back to being very local, but at the same time, giving the schools and the business managers the tools to actually manage it and not create a bigger problem, which is an admin problem for them. So I do think, I mean, we're currently trying to create a toolkit for business managers, but, you know, I, I do think it's, the beginning of the conversation is how can we source locally from farmers and you know for British produce and I think that might be you know the way forward with procurement but I, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work but I, I think I'm on a mission to make sure that we start helping schools to do so. Helen you've been working on this for many years um at our last event, we did we did ask the producer, did they did they sell anything into the public sector? And the answer was no, but was waiting for the calls. What about from your side? What do you what do you see this this opportunity much talked about? Is is it there? Well, I think it's there, but I think it's always been a, a hard one. Some people have some farmers have done a great job in accessing some of these markets and and really gearing up to do that. I think the challenges at a farm level are that you often have seasonal supply of things. And so you need to be working in a more dynamic relationship uh, with, the, with the schools or with the public procurers uh, so that you can roll with the seasons a bit. Um, and I think uh, some of the um, work that's being done around dynamic food procurement and how uh, one can set up those tenders and those briefs to make them accessible and realistic for uh, smaller scale producers are really helpful. And you probably need to make sure that you're um, able to uh, put things through a, maybe a hub which actually allows uh, the consolidation of product from different sources, farm, farm sources, so that you haven't got lots of white vans running around in circles and farmers trying to deliver small amounts to lots of different schools or caterers. So you've got to try and make a system efficient, actually, as well, both for the procurers and also for the, 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 the farmers themselves so that they can actually access those markets. It's been quite a difficult thing to get that to work. It has worked in some cases, but we need to help it work better. Um, and, uh, and I think because of the cost pressures too, um, it's not necessarily the first market that your farmer is going to look for when they know they're always going to be squeezed on price, where there's always going to be that pressure there. So how do we build those uh, relationships that are actually going to be viable for the producer, um, make sense for the school, for the procurer, the caterer, um, can be flexible enough in menu design to deal with the seasonality issues and to deal with the distribution um, and fulfillment issues, which uh, need to be very practically handled. Super. And what, building on Stephanie's point around the role of government and the, on the back of the national food strategy, do you see an opportunity? Do you see a moment on this? Is clearly, clearly what you're all saying is, you know, needs significant government support. Well, it does. And I think that there's uh, at the moment we're seeing a stalling because um, uh, local authority um, budgets are, are, are tight. Um, COVID obviously hasn't helped. We've had schools in and out. Um, so there's it's been a very rocky time, I think, for, for trying to get progress on these things. But it is so frustrating that we have been talking about this forever and doing stuff on this forever and that it still isn't the norm. And Stephanie was quite right to bring up the balanced scorecard and all that hurrah around this a few years ago, which again, hasn't really transpired into anything. So we need to, I mean, this is such a crucial investment. The investment we make in children's health could not be better placed if we're looking to try and make sure that we've got a healthy, you know, vibrant, learning well population of children coming through the system, then it's so short term to cut in this area. Um, we know, we, I know as a farmer, if I don't feed my animals well when they're little and get their nutrition right, they're never going to thrive. And our, our people are never going to thrive. So it is such a short term uh, approach to just be penny pinching in this area, which is all about the future of, 
of, of the country or the future of the world, actually, if we, you know, so, so this needs to be a really concerted effort. Government do, does need to give this the resource. They do need to give local authorities the resource to be able to make sure that school meals are the best they can be. And, uh, and they should take so much inspiration from the work that Nicole and Stephanie and all of us have been doing, showing what's possible. Um, and, uh, and, and after COVID and all the challenges we face, this, 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 surely this is the moment to nail it. I hope the national food strategy is going to be taken on board, that we do end up with a food bill that actually really does um, uh, put this centre stage rather than as a sort of constantly leftover bit of something that they're not getting to. Simon, can I just jump in with, with two thoughts um, before we move on? Number one to say, because um, Helen hasn't said it, Food for Life have done a brilliant job in this area by putting together a, an accreditation for caterers. Because it means that people like me who came to this knowing absolutely nothing could just point to those that have worked it out before. And so I could go into the local authority and say, look, there's this thing called Food for Life. It's an accreditation. You'll know it'll be inspected. You'll know it'll be measured and it'll do the work for you. So if you don't know what your ambition is, have a look at this. And this is a great starting point. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it is a way and it's available. So that's number one. Number two, DFE needs to finish the work on the school food standards. We are still saying to schools that they need to serve meat three times a week. This makes no sense. If we can try to keep costs down and we're trying to respond to the climate emergency, we need to get this piece of work done, revise the standards to look at sh sugar and, and fiber, which was promised in the um, child obesity program uh, policy in 2016 and get that work done. I absolutely understand that COVID has put a spanner in the works. The, the work had started, the new standards were gonna be tested. But it's going to be two years before we even get start the process again. And it needs to be done urgently um, so that we can get that procurement, we can get the standards right. Great. Nicole, is there anything you, you want to add to the wish list for government now? Um, I was just actually going to add one thing before you asked me the question. And I think what's fundamental that everybody is on the same page with is also the education for kids. Um, as you saw, the enthusiasm of, you know, the kitchen staff, the kids end up being really passionate about the food they eat. And um, the Hackney School of Food, which is actually on the Mandeville School site, um, is built purely to get the children to harvest and eat what they've harvested. And I think the knowledge around vegetables, I mean, I always joke that it used to take such a long time of blitzing vegetables in every kind of sauce um, until we were actually harvesting with them that pull you know a carrot out of the ground then eat it straight away so I think the vital element or key to success with all of this is the education as well around food in schools absolutely and I forgot the question but that's <laughs> no no that's perfect that's perfect <laughs> So we should segue now into our third film, which um, was really a sense of looking at the end of the chain, how we're shopping, some of the obligations that retailers are under now to deliver net zero, and also um, you know, the diversity and opportunities for, for buying and sourcing less and better meat and dairy. So, um, I'll take us to our, our third film, which is called Project. You can genuinely get really great quality, organic veggies, great for the planet, but it's also really tasty and fresh. Consumers more and more are caring about the ethical conditions that their meat is raised in and eating less meat, but better meat is becoming more and more popular amongst our visitors and our consumers. Yes. Three for a tanner. Yep. Yes, that's perfect. That's lovely. Yeah. The science is absolutely crystal clear. We need to change the way we produce and consume food. There's no getting away from that. And number one thing that we can do is to eat less and better meat. What you actually get in the box is changes each week based on seasonality. Since the pandemic, habits have changed. 
more of us are shopping locally and taking greater interest in where our food comes from, finding inspiration from the local food landscape. Always like think of buying, like sourcing locally or like I prefer like artisan products and also eating loads more vegetables because I just feel much healthier when I do that. We've never been huge meat eaters, so we probably have meat once a week and I like to um, I like to keep to that. But yes, I'm a massive fan of making an exciting salad, putting lots of textures and lots of colours in there, which you can do with all kinds of different vegetables and um, nuts and grains and keep it very exciting. I've just signed up for Vegetable Box, so I'm just kind of thinking about being healthier for myself, eating less meat, kind of making more use of, of vegetables. I'm more inclined to spend more money on the meat, knowing where it's come from, because I'm not buying the quantities. So I'd rather buy a higher welfare meat and pay a little bit more money. We do have to reduce our meat consumption, that's really important. Um, if you can shop locally at butchers, fishmongers for example, you can have that conversation with them, find out where exactly the meat is coming from so you know if the practices are more ethical. Organic meat for example from local farms will be so much better in terms of the quality of meat and also the conditions in which the animals are reared. Cost and convenience greatly influence where we shop, and 9 out of 10 of us visit a supermarket at least once a week. Buying better meat in store means looking for labels that ensure higher animal welfare and environmental standards. In 2018, the co-op moved all its own brand fresh pork to 100% British outdoor bread from RSPCA Assured Farms, gaining a Compassion and World Farming Award, and it has ambitions to go further. Agriculture is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases and a really big contributor to the challenges that we've got around climate change, and meat production, dairy production in particular, are a part of that. So, you know, obviously we are committed to taking action to, to address those issues, whether that's working with our farmers to help them improve their efficiency, to uh, start that journey to a less but better approach. Hello. Retailers are absolutely critical on giving us the options and choices to help us eat a more healthy and sustainable diet. That's about providing more plant-based options. That's about providing better meat. That's about providing us with the inspiration for us to cook and eat better. As well as moderating our meat and dairy consumption, we all need to be eating more vegetables, and we need retailers to help us do that. Eating Better found that plant-based is the fastest growing ready meals category. We just recently launched our Grow range of products which we're really proud of, which have really landed well with customers and we've invested in price to make those products accessible to more customers so that for those people that do want to um, reduce their meat consumption, and we know there are lots of them, they've got a really easy, convenient choice to come and pick up when they come into their co-op store. If we just make a few small changes, say changing your breakfast to a plant diet and then gradually moving that onto breakfast and lunch into a plant diet, if you're having two um, plant-based meals a day, we're actually talking about 730 meals in a year that you've saved from animal products. It just takes us all to make those slight, small changes to our diet, think about being more plant-based, and collectively that can make a huge impact. We absolutely need to transform the way we produce and consume food if we're going to fix the climate and nature emergency, particularly in this next decade of action. Nothing is going to happen at the speed and scale that we need without the political will. We're asking government to step up to the plate. That was our, our third film, really trying to hit home the, the importance of the way we needing to change as well as the way we need to produce.
I wonder if we could just dwell on um, one of what what are the thoughts from the panel around the sort of key barriers to really driving this change. We clearly in this film we clearly have major retailers that are looking at this agenda, um, encouraging us to eat more plant based, eat less and better meat. Um, we have more hopefully growing options across the landscape. We've talked about the public sector. I mean, Helen, you've worked on this topic a long time, along with Stephanie and Nicole. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on what, what, what's stopping us right now? Well, I think, I think quite a lot of things. And I think um, one thing for your, you know, uh, us as consumers, I think is that a little bit like um, uh, the lady serving school food in the earlier film said, we didn't grow up thinking about how we grew, how we cook vegetables in ways that are really great and tasty. And I think still there's a, a slight danger as we move towards more plant-based diets that people will grab convenience foods because they still don't feel they've got the skills um, in the kitchen to actually uh, make, make the kind of meals that their families are going to want to eat from plant-based resources. So I think whether you're talking about schools or whether you're talking about all of us, we've all got, we've all got some upskilling to do in terms of actually producing really tasty, fantastic food from more plant-based ingredients. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there was a time, you know, 15 years ago where if you want, went for the vegetarian option when you were eating out, it was a pretty rum affair. That's shifting a lot. You can now get fantastic vegetarian and vegan food um, in most restaurants and in most high streets. Um, but I think we're still a little bit challenged about producing that at home sometimes. So another reason why, as Nicole said, we've got to really focus on uh, children's skills in schools in terms of cooking, um, because I think that's going to be a, a hugely important part of the mix. Um, there's lots more to talk about too, but I think uh, giving time for food um, and making sure people have got uh, in their homes the ability to cook from scratch um, you know the resources to cook from scratch as well as the knowledge a lot of houses are being built without proper kitchens people are living in environments where they don't have access to those kind of things and making sure that we can deliver the convenience that people have sought um, as well as the uh, you know the the the, 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 the taste uh, factors that they're looking for so I think some of those things are quite important. Thank you. Nicole, do you want to pick up on, you must be thinking about this a lot, how to inspire us all to cook. Well, many, many of the great chefs talk about a whole generation lost of cooking and we're encouraging people to cook things rather more complex. And obviously the big criticism that we all may receive is we're driving people into convenience and processed food, which the big supermarkets and manufacturers want us to buy. So. I mean, how, how do we deal with this? Um, to be quite honest, it, it's funny. I, when I think back of when I started at Gayhurst, um, I actually used to struggle cooking in bulk because you're not cooking for a small number of people. You're actually, you know, cooking for 600 children on average in most primary schools. So to actually do vegetarian, I remember we did a beetroot curry and I always I think it's one of the memories I think I'll have in my old age as well that you know we boiled beetroots and then we peeled them and then we cut them up in perfect squares and we did this really beautiful beetroot curry and I think it was one of the worst vegetarian recipes we could have served so it was it is trying to learn how to actually you know it's really important that it's not only looking at menus and looking at costs and looking at the food supply chain, it's actually looking at what the kids are eating in the dining hall. It was useless us trying, you know, to feed them this beetroot curry, for example, and they were leaving the dining hall hungry. So that's, you know, when we realized that it was actually the things that we did outside the dining hall, which meant that it became part of the curriculum and also part of their everyday learning, if, if you'd like to say that you know we, we prefer to, to say that the dining hall is an extension of the classroom because that's how they started to learn the different veg and actually discover taste which you know sometimes um, it's really hard to get flavor in volume once again 
you know so it's understanding that the children will eat something if it tastes if it's spiced right you know and that's then a whole other conversation because every child has an opinion is either too less of a spice or too much of a spice and most of the time you didn't get it as well as their mom spiced it but apart from this I think all I'm trying to say is that you know it's really important that there is an element of understanding that the child is the customer and cooking really good food made with love I think is the key to get them to eat you know more vegetarian food um, we actually most of our cakes now have vegetables in them I just want to add that because I think <laughs> it's another thing that was my greatest learning in the eight years of doing school food is that a beetroot well a beetroot cake a courgette cake that's you know one of the key recipes I think to get kids to eat veg. Thanks Nicole I I imagine we'd all agree on this call around the importance of food education and getting it central to the curriculum. But Stephanie, how the hell do you do that when space on the school curriculum is so so sought after? What well, look, goes? Yeah. How, how do you build that sort of holistic food education that I guess everybody going to the Oxford Real Farming Conference would want to see it into the curriculum? OK, breaking news. It's been mandatory on the curriculum since 2014. <laughs> That's the thing we need to remember, because every time I come to one of these conferences, we have lots of really energetic, fabulous people going, what we need is food education on the curriculum. It's there. It just does not have the focus it needs. And the, again, the National Food Strategy has done a brilliant job of saying, let's make food education as important as maths and English. It needs the profile. Children are at school 190 days. We have a lot of opportunity here to influence their relationship with food. And I think we have a duty to do that. But as long as it's seen as a very poor relation and a bit of a bolt on, it's quite hard to, um, to, get it the to give it the focus it needs. And we still have this very strange anomaly whereby parents have to pay for ingredients for food lessons which just to me seems completely bonkers when you wouldn't expect them to bring in chemicals for a chemistry lesson or um, things for a biology class. So, uh, but that's just lack of um, prioritizing. It's lack of priority for this subject. And I think, you know, we, I don't want to get gloomy here, but we have appalling statistics on child obesity, children's health. We have a climate emergency. Surely these are good reasons for talking about food in schools. Surely this is an opportunity to say, we can make a difference as young people. Greta has shown us, she's our pinup. Surely we can make a difference and food is a really positive way of doing this. So, you know, we have to make sure that that um, curriculum, which is really great, look back at the school food plan materials, the, the modules for learning are really excellent. The language is really positive and inspiring. The problem is it hasn't filtered through. It's a, it's a module within DT. Um, it needs to be across every subject. Um, Nicole, Helen, they all know about this cross-curricular learning. There's an opportunity to get food into every lesson and normalize conversations about food. And so that it's not the poor relation it has been for many, many years. We're talking here quite a lot about schools, which is absolutely right. Um, uh, but the, the, your final film there took us into the wider, you know, what are we all doing as consumers and how is the whole supply chain working? And I think one of the really fundamental problems we've got is that actually it's really hard for anybody in the supply chain to make much money out of fresh food. Um, you know, raw ingredients, uh, everybody ends up processing food a lot whether it's meat or whether it's vegetables um, in order to give them more shelf life because retailers want long shelf lives um, consumers want uh, stuff that's going to last in the fridge when they get it home um, and and there's really very little margin to be made on fresh food and so our whole food system is geared towards processing food more. And I know we're talking here about less but better, better meat, but one of the dangers I think we face is that we are still going to replace uh, some of those uh, meat dishes with very processed um, but plant-based uh, foods. And that's not gonna take us where we need to go either. 
So I do think we've got to think quite fundamentally about how do we uh, stack our food system in the right direction so that fresh food is valued, uh, everybody can make a fair income from it, um, as well as you know people can use this well in the home and know how to cook and all the rest of it. But at the moment, um, it's actually quite hard, and I know this firsthand, um, to actually make, uh, make ends meet commercially um, selling fresh food through the system. And I think the retailers find that too. So it's, it's, you know, the whole system is geared towards let's process it more, give it more shelf life, put more salt and sugar in because that makes it last a bit longer. Um, and uh, we've got to get off that bandwagon very quickly as well. Thanks, Helen. Absolutely. Um, agree with you on that. Um, so we're, we're at our hour, as we agreed, so we're going to, there's plenty of questions in the chat, so I think it's a good opportunity to um, throw those questions back to our panel. Um, hopefully everybody who participate goes away with some fresh ideas and inspiration. I certainly am. Um, the first question, Sarah, you've asked around, and I think we've sort of touched on, but it'd be good to hear from each of the panel. I mean, what's the best way, what's the best way of building the relationship between local farmers and the, and the public sector, like schools? Um, how do we get, make those connections? You know, and we've talked about education, we've talked about procurement. I mean, what's your recommendation there? If you're, if you're a farmer, what, what should you be doing? Who wants to kick that one off? Well, I think we do need a tendering system which actually makes those contracts available to local producers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as I said earlier on, I think that's absolutely critical um, because uh, that they are largely geared towards a larger scale suppliers who can do three, six, five days. So I think all the stuff around dynamic food procurement and possibly uh, bringing in more food hubs that actually do bring product together and make it more convenient for caterers to purchase from one source. I mean, it's hard, it, it, not just for caterers, but for food service generally, for restaurants, hotels, if they're having to ring up 12 different suppliers to get their different things, um, they're just, when the chefs are busy, they're just going to think, oh, I'll just call that one company that can supply everything for me. So as farmers, we've got to make it easy uh, for, the, for, for those people to purchase from us um, we probably need some help in actually getting our act together around that we need local processing facilities so that actually we can turn our food into something that's uh, suitable to go into those kitchens um, and uh, but we also need uh, the contracts to be um, uh, viable for us um, and so there's work to do on both sides there Thanks, Helen. And I'm sure there are discussions alongside the conference around dynamic procurement and some of the opportunities and some of the organisations working in that area. Um, Stephanie, you've been working on this. What, where, what's your advice? It's a, it's a really tricky one. As I say, I, the charity has a strapline farm gate school plate, and I, I honestly thought it was going to be incredibly easy. And I went out and met farmers and said, you know, can't you supply our school food? I really like what you're doing. And I, I genuinely believed it was going to be that easy. Um, as Helen said, there needs to be access to the big contracts for these, provide, to these growers and producers. Um, there is an opportunity to specify within a school food contract that you want to look at local procurement and local growers um, and it's interesting that when we did this way back in 2010, um, we did have caterers respond. So when we started talking about, you know, wanting to know about where the food was coming from, um, talk about the supply chain, introduce us to your farmers and your growers, um, they did respond, but it's, it's, it's complex. And I, you know, I'm thinking in the last 15 years that I've been doing this, I remember Mike Duckett used to talk about this at um, the Hospital of Royal Brompton, wasn't it? And he did exactly the same thing. Um, talk to farmers about why are they ploughing their cauliflowers into the field because they're too big for the supermarkets, well, give them to me. Um, we need to have better processes. Um, I'm sure there are people who are cleverer at this stuff than I am, but um, it just feels really complicated. It, it feels like it shouldn't be. Um, Nicole, how do you how do you do it? Um, I guess, to be fair, um, 
I think a lot of the schools that we work with go out and actually find the suppliers that they want to work with themselves. Um, in saying that, I remember a bit like you, Stephanie, I went to a farm and I said, can't we just buy potatoes from you? And the farmer was like, yes, but who's going to wash them? And I was like, oh, a simple thing that you don't look at in, in the chain. I mean, there, it would be a nightmare if you had to have 50 kilos of potatoes being delivered. You know, it's, some, it's a bit of the food process that you wouldn't have thought of. So I do think it is very tricky. And even though I think we're all wanting the same thing to actually get there, I think it would mean a lot of working towards a lot of problems and issues that would come up, I think, um, by actually getting uh, a link to produce that's local. On big scale as well, I think small schools are easier than, than um, bigger schools and yeah, I guess all schools from the same source as well. Peter Gregg's just put a comment in the chat, which I completely agree with, you know, um, how important to reimagine a functional localised food supply infrastructure. The infrastructure is required because you're absolutely right, Nicole, washing the potatoes, washing the carrots, actually getting them into a form where it's going to be easy for the school or the, or the caterer to deal with them. Um, actually, abattoirs, when we're talking about the meat side of things, it's so difficult to do that locally now. Uh, all of that infrastructure has disappeared. And we, we, not, we, we need to start building that in a way that's actually going to allow these products to flow efficiently, cost effectively from the farm to the marketplace to shorten those supply chains. And that is going to require somehow some investment in that uh, local and regional infrastructure. Thanks, Helen. Just wanting to sort of latch on to more um, the question Maureen's making about public health. We're sort of building field builders in a way, and certainly in our experience this year, public health and particularly at a local level, obviously totally inundated by the pandemic, but it's a key, a key audience and a key driver around driving better food, better healthy local food. It'd be interesting to hear from you guys in terms of what you're doing around the public health side and where you see the opportunity is there obviously that that is changing within central government and we're waiting to see where diets and the broader discussion fits um what what impetus can we really can we leverage public health better as a, as a movement on this agenda um I'm, I might just sort of jump in and talk about the work of Impact on Urban Health that Guys in St Thomas's charity. Um, there's a bit of an evidence gap and they're doing a brilliant job of investing in a 10 year programme looking um, at childhood obesity um, as a public health initiative and looking at health inequalities. And I think we now, even very early on in this journey, we're with the narratives of ch narrative has changed on obesity and we're talking more about health inequality now and we've moved on from the blame culture and started looking at the environment the food environment um so that's really interesting work if anybody doesn't know of it um impact on urban health so they have identified three areas of influence which is the street going back to that um film about the consumer um, looking at what the consumer sees when they look at, walk along their local high street and all of the quite negative um, impacts on their health of what's available to them on the high street at an affordable price. They're looking at the home, so back to that um, conversation about skills um, and learning about food and learning how to um, work with less processed food. And of course, they're looking at schools. Um, it's 10 years, so it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of that and to see what happens when you change the food environment from a public health perspective, what impact that has on um, citizens' health. Um, so that's the part, one of the, 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 the projects we're looking at closely to see if we can shift the dial when it comes to health inequality and, and also the work we're doing um, calling for a, a government re review of school food policy in the, in the same way to see if we can make the system 
um, fairer to all so that every child can access good nutrition and there aren't great big holes in um, eligibility. Um, so that's really been, that's our focus at School Food Matters at the moment. Thanks, Stephanie. It's a really exciting project to be doing over 10 years. So looking forward to tracking the results. Um, <laughs> Helen, have you got, I mean, the thoughts on the, on the public health side? Well, one thing I was just going to mention is that, you know, what, one of the challenges we've got at the farm end is that we're not producing enough of these healthy uh, crops on our on our farms. I mean, we're uh, I think we import 85 percent of the fruit we consume in the UK um, and uh, over half the veg. And so there's a real need to stimulate and support uh, more horticulture. Uh, more uh, pulse and nut production. There's very little nut production in the UK and nuts are both carbon negative uh, and also incredibly good for us. Um, so there's a real opportunity to be thinking about a more diverse uh, crop range. Um, we still uh, eat the majority of our cal calories from just four, uh, you know, four plant types. Um, and uh, we know that diversity in the diet, um, I think from a good diversity from a cultural point of view, uh, you know, all of those things are really important. So we do need to really stimulate uh, the horticultural sector. And uh, we're, I'm really interested in the agroforestry, tree crops and that kind of stuff. There's so much more to do at that end as well, so that we aren't just pulling in uh, imports as we um, as we crank up, hopefully, uh, the five a day to seven a day in the in the kind of UK diet. Nicole, perhaps you could take the question around. Um, I think we've talked a lot about chefs and the steamed and boiled the way they killed the veg. Um, but obviously, a, a, you know, a concern very much by many of our stakeholders is obviously a move towards more processed food at, at a school, school catering level because of price and convenience. Uh, Mandeville is a shining light in terms of the, you know, cooking and experience. But how do we avoid that? What, what do you think needs to happen from your experience as chefs and skills so we don't, we don't sort of lead to a transition into more processed food? Um, I think it's about empowering the people in the kitchen as well. I mean, as you saw with the team um, at Mandeville, uh, they, they are writing their own menus, they're working with the seasons, they're phoning suppliers and checking what is sustainable to buy at what period of time. Um, so I think as much as we can all talk about wanting change, I think it's actually you know, the amount of hard work, gratitude, recognition that the school teams, kitchen teams in general, um, need to start feeling that the role is really important. Um, I was joking about the soil in the potatoes, but what I wanted to actually say, which is a question in the chat, is that um, we've learned from experience that it's useless solving one problem to create another. You know, you actually have to see along the day or along the food chain, if you're solving this problem with this solution, how is it going to end up? Is the workforce needing to work more? Do they have the right equipment? Are they trained correctly? Are the kids actually eating this food that we want to be serving? So it's not as simple as just saying, you know, what is the solution? Because most of the time there's a solution, but you're sort of creating another problem further down the line. I think what we commonly all know is that we just want to provide the best that we can for the kids that we're serving. And I guess it's all, you know, there are different solutions and, you know, there's a lot of work that has been done that is being done now. And I think thanks to COVID, I've never felt that charities have come together so much and so strongly trying to do the same thing and schools as well. I mean, I know I think uh, Georgina, the head teacher at Greenside is here as well. Um, their solution, I, I got a text one day about a bread oven and before I know it, they now have bread education in their school. So, you know, it's this coming together of head teachers, charities, leaders, government as well and policy. I mean, a lot has been done with the national food strategy as well about the curriculum. So I, I do think we're at a really good place so I want, wanted to maybe end on that note and try and say that I didn't mean that washing soil um, another person Sarah from Roe 
knows the benefits of teaching kids just to put their hands in soil makes you know makes a difference and makes a change in the school day and I'm totally for uh, adding worms to soil as a lesson I just think that it's useless creating a solution to one thing but then it leads to a problem further down the line. Thanks Nicole. Um, Helen on the question that Jake's asking around the demand and the sort of future diets that you talk to um, you're a livestock farmer yourself you speak to many farmers across the of the field I mean what what's your advice to farmers in terms of we've got some heavy lifting to do in terms of encouraging people to eat a healthy more sustainable diet we know we're a long way from that in the UK there's no I'm not sort of hand on heart saying we're we're in any way close to it um how, how do you balance that conversation with with farmers that feel slightly un you know threatened by some of this agenda concerns about you know what you talked around processed food and the growth of that that we get the wrong wrong what what how, how do you how do you pitch this well, I guess for me and probably for the Soil Association, what we want to see is the end of the really industrial, low welfare of farming systems that are, um, are using too much antibiotic, particularly in other countries. Uh, we want to see farm animals having a good life, a uh, real opportunity to, to thrive. And we see them as being hugely important in our future farming systems. Grazing livestock, as you showed in your film, can be hugely helpful, recycling fertility, building soil fertility. It, it, they have a very strong role to play supporting biodiversity. What we need to do, if I'm honest, is to get rid of those animals that are being kept in factory conditions uh, that are not being treated well um, and which have a huge impact on you know using all the soil coming in from uh, you know threatened environments. So I think it is about less but better. And I think farmers who are doing a great job with their livestock, uh, using them in inappropriate ways. I still think, and I see this in myself on my own farm, we need to keep diversifying. That's why I'm so interested in agroforestry. We're starting to grow nut crops and doing other things as well. Uh, so I think that, you know, we have to try and work out where is the balance here that's the right balance where animals are playing their rightful role. They're not competing with humans for foodstuffs, um, but they are supporting the biodiversity and the environments that we need to see. So I don't think that farmers who are farming agroecologically uh, should feel threatened by this at all. I think that, uh, that you know, we are keen to see animals playing their rightful role. Um, but I do think that um, there are some types of animal farming that for every reason uh, need to go extinct quite quickly. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it, but I know that as soon as you start talking about less meat, um, even organic farmers will feel, my gosh, you know, don't, we can't, we can't do that. These animals we're used to, farm. this is what we do. This is our business model. This is what we like to do. And I understand that as a farmer myself, I farm a lot of animals. I love farming. I love farming livestock. Um, but I think we, uh, we, we do need to get this balance right, not just from a climate change point of view, but from an antibiotic resistance point of view and from a land take uh, perspective as well. We need to bring more trees into our farmed environment so that we're not compromising, we're not uh, reducing the uh, carbon opportunities through our life that will benefit our livestock too. So there is a really great middle way through all of this, um, but the debate too easily becomes very polarized and people feel threatened rather than actually trying to find uh, this middle way, which has livestock playing their a great role in our farming systems, um, uh, but actually not doing the damage that um, uh, we will continue to do. We will blow up the planet if we try and feed everybody as much meat as the Americans or even the British eat today. Helen, I was struck by one of the questions we got over Twitter and Nicole's comment about everybody having a chicken nugget. And I think the comment over Twitter was, well, why, why don't we just squeeze the supply on some of the worst uh, forms of meat you talked about, intensive industrial, and, and we, we're becoming a hotbed of that, of chicken in the UK. I mean, what what's your sense when you're asked that, or your focus on that, and that obviously is largely coming into the public sector among, you know, other avenues. I, and 
I, I'm really nervous about the way uh, chicken, what, you know, people are moderating in some areas, but chicken, the growth of chicken continues and chicken um, uh, is, is uh, the most intensively farmed type of meat. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm bemused by people shifting to chicken, um, uh, thinking that it's either a better, a better climate option or it's a healthier option. Um, so we've got a campaign uh, running called Peak Poultry, uh, which is really looking at the way we feed the animals that feed us, um, particularly poultry, um, and the repercussions uh, in threatened environments for this, uh, you know, a constant thirst for more and more uh, white meat. So um, chicken, uh, you know, we all love chicken occasionally, but it needs to, we need to row back. Uh, we need to be seeing that as a treat, not an, uh, not an everyday staple, um, not as a carrier for a sauce. You know, it's, it can be such a bland meat, actually. There's so many other things that can carry a sauce well. Um, but that reliance on chicken, I think, has been is really worrying from every angle. Um, so uh, peak poultry is, um, we hope that we have hit peak poultry and that we will start to come down the other side quite quickly. And very supportive of those companies that are moving into the better chicken commitment. Um, you know, the people who are really uh, looking at slower growing breeds and really trying to resolve some of the big welfare issues that have been in the poultry sector for, for several decades now. Um, uh, we need to be doing that a lot, lot better. And some uh, great companies have really committed uh, to going forward in the right vein. Thanks, Helen. Um, St Stephanie, I wonder if you could take the question around um, from Emma around high welfare. And I mean, so much of what we hear in the public sector is about big contracts. And you talked about, then I think Nicole talked about, you know, the guarantee of supply and everybody's worried about supply at the moment. Isn't it just easier to go to one supplier? Is it always, always going to be like about big suppliers? Helen's touched on dynamic procurement. I mean, what, where do you, how do you, how would you respond to Emma's question? Um, I, I haven't actually seen the question, but if the question is about um, big catering companies and school food, um, I keep on going back to the getting the contract right. It's going back to getting that contract right so that you build in standards. Whilst government isn't um, monitoring school food, what we have available to us is food for life. Um, we know that that accreditation is inspected. Um, and it's just asking for what you want. It sounds so simplistic, but I, I, I just think there's such a, um, people get very overwhelmed and you can get the big contract caterers to deliver excellent food. We've seen that through the Soil Association's accreditation. We have all the big contract caterers in that scheme, but they are being asked to deliver a menu that meets higher standards. And there is great kudos in doing that. And it's a you know, well, um, well acknowledged mark of excellence. So we need a bit more of that. And you can write that into a contract and say, this is our aspiration. You could start off at bronze and work your way up, or you could start at silver and say, we want to be at gold in three years. And if you're getting that delivery right and you are valuing your catering team and giving them the training and expertise they need to deliver great food, um, the, the meal numbers will go up. And as I say, we've got universal input free school meals now, which really helps with that process because there's um, guaranteed numbers. Um, so it's all about the contract. So bring on some more training, I think, in that regard. Thanks, thanks, Steph. Thank, thanks, Emma, for your comment in the in the um, in the uh, in the chat about pay as you feel community canteen. That sounds amazing. Send us more information. Um, I'd, I'd just like to turn our attention, just conscious of time, back back to our panel. Really, I mean, what a few people have commented on is the fact that. We are quite organised as a group of, of civil society organisations and farmers, and this discussion is happening across both this conference and, and the Oxford Farming Conference around the corner or virtually around the corner this year. Um, what, what's your sense over the next sort of critical 10 years um, that we're all talking about out to 2030? What's your, what, what's your vision? Uh, of, of what we need to be doing and, and, and what, what would you like to see come out of the National Food Strategy and now 
potential food bill um, to give us a sense of where, where we should all be focused, particularly in the next year. I'm, I always worry about the 2030 discussion that we all sort of sit around to 2030. What should we be doing now? Stephanie. Um, well, I'm sorry I keep coming back to schools, but that's my area of expertise, and I guess that's why you've got me here. But the um, we've got to try and sort out school food funding and policy. It's really complicated, and um, it's been really interesting. COVID has shown this really clearly when we had the whole complexity around feeding children during school closures, children that are entitled to free school meals. I had so many conversations with school heads, school bursars during that time saying, which bit of money is it? Is it going to be the universal money that comes in or is it going to be the benefits related free school meals? It's really complicated. And, it, you know, it's also not ring fenced. So, you know, if I was to say there was one thing that we need to do in relation to school food, I mean, you know, obviously the big thing is to get reform of policy that might take a little bit longer. Um, but in the short term, there just needs to be some transparency around how the money is being spent. And we need to get people to start asking questions about this. And that means schools reporting on how they're spending the money because there is money flowing into the system. I go back to universal and free school meals. That is a massive investment in school catering, but we're not hearing about how effectively it's being spent. And we need to get those stories out of schools because if we start hearing good positive school stories about great food in schools and good spend of investment in the local economy or um, in school menus, others will follow. But there's just a lack of monitoring. There's a lack of compliance, we know. Um, so I think getting some of those stories um, out of schools will be really valuable. Um, right. I just, yeah. I'm just conscious of time. Nicole, do you want to throw in a quick minute? Um, yes, I, um, my romantic vision would be all schools would be gold schools. And I remember I was working with Woodminston and they were looking at being a gold school with the Soil Association. And the bit of being working with a local farm, um, I guess the, sh the chef was like, well, why don't we build a farm on the school promise premises? Mm -hmm. And I know, I know that sometimes they're unique, but I think it's this kind of thinking of going back to growing and the education side that is going to be the solution. Because with chicken, I feel it's supply and demand especially in secondary schools, if kids are demanding that they want to have, you know, certain type of food, then unfortunately, the shift would be in the education rather than in not supplying that meal. So my romantic vision would be that all schools did some sort of growing let's, or links to a farm. But let's build the farm on the school. I love that. <laughs> I mean, I do live on Streatham High Street so I'm <laughs> as far away from a farm as you can imagine but <laughs> Helen you you've been working around the food strategy and and you know working across this where would you um where would you like to see well I think in the very immediate future I'd just like government to implement the national food strategy in its entirety um and uh, and that would start start setting us off on the right on the right direction and at the same time we've got to get uh, the ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Schemes, right, with, there's been another announcement about that today, um, but there's still work to do in that area, but we've got to get those incentives right for farmers, and some of those private markets actually they're starting to develop uh, working in the right kind of way, so they're driving uh, the right kind of change. But uh, on my top priority, let's implement the National Food Strategy, um, and then uh, we'll be setting off in a direction which will give us uh, a more agroecological future and a chance for healthy and sustainable diets to be available to everyone, everywhere, which has got to be our goal. Thank you, Helen. Absolutely, absolutely great piece of work, and just we need to see it happen this year. So it's an exciting way to start the year and much work to do i want to thank our three excellent panelists uh really great that we're all working closely on this agenda that there is so much alignment so much work to do but you know certainly great opportunities